Hi guys, Kieran McAvoy here from A Clever Chimp, and on this channel we talk, learn and discuss about maths, physics and all things engineering. This video is part of our guide to engineering maths, and today we're going to be going through matrix multiplication, arguably one of the most important things you need to know how to do when it comes to matrix algebra. All of that is coming right up. Okay, so when it comes to matrix multiplication, I think the best thing to do is, again, make sure we understand why we actually have to do it in this special order anyway, you know? So the best place to start is simultaneous equations, because again, that's where matrices came from. So if you watched my linear equations video, you'll know that we can understand a system of linear equations, in our case, two linear equations, as a way in which we can transform a point, an x and y point, onto another point. Because instead of thinking of two lines, we can think of the fact that the left-hand side of the equations are asking for an x and y value. So why not give it an x and y value and see what it gives back? Let's start off with our 2D plane. And on that plane, we have our point, x1, y1. And we pick two arbitrary linear equations to transform it onto another point, x2, y2. So now take that point, x2, y2, and transform it with another set of arbitrary linear equations onto x3, y3. Now here's the question. Is there a way in which we can pick another arbitrary set of simultaneous equations that will get us from the green dot x1, y1 to the red dot x3, y3? So let's go back to our original point x1, y1 and we'll think of two generic linear equations that will transform that point onto x2, y2. Now although the subscripts of the coefficients of the variables might throw you off a little bit, they will become very obvious as to why they're 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2 in due course when we start putting it into matrix form. But for now, let's think about them as the first number of the subscript refers to the equation that they're in. So one being the first equation, two being the second equation. And the second number refers to the term on the left-hand side that they're in. So one being the first term on the left-hand side and two being the second term on the left-hand side. So we have the equations for the generic transform from x1, y1 to x2, y2. Now let's use x2, y2 to transform in a generic fashion to x3, y3. So on the screen we have our generic linear equations transforming x2, y2 onto x3, y3. So now let's start moving towards our goal of getting x3, y3 in terms of x1, y1 because then that will tell us how to transform from x1, y1 to x3, y3. To do this, let's sub in the values of x2, y2 into the linear equations involving x3 and y3. So what we've done now is we've just subbed in x2, y2 into the x3, y3 simultaneous equations. And let's now do a little bit of rearranging to get it in the same form so that we can understand it in terms of x1 and y1. So here we have the transformation linear equations from x1, y1 to x3, y3. And you can see that the coefficients of these x1s and y1s are a combination of the coefficients from the first transformation and the coefficients from the second transformation. Now the interesting pattern to notice here is that in the coefficients of all the x1s and y1s, the a variables have subscripts where their rows or their equations that they used to be in stays constant. So if you notice in the top equation, all of the a variables have the first subscript of 1 in their coefficients. And notice how the b variable in the coefficients of x1 and y1 remains constant dependent on the term that it was in. So the second subscript of all the b variables in each of the co coefficients remains constant within that coefficient. So it's this kind of thinking that actually defined matrix multiplication and how we 
tackle matrix multiplication today. And so there had to be a way in which we could reproduce this in a methodical manner. And that's why we put it into this square format called a matrix. So in terms of matrix algebra then, what we've done is we've taken our vector x1, y1, and we've multiplied that by our matrix B with all of the B coefficients in it. And that's given us x2, y2. And then we've multiplied that result, all of that, by our matrix A, which has then given us our final vector of x3, y3. So let's compare the separate matrices A and B when multiplying x1, y1 to when we have all of the coefficients of x1 and y1 in a matrix multiplying x1 and y1 to achieve the same result, getting us to the vector x3, y3. What we notice is that the elements in the combined matrix look a little bit like we're summing the products of the elements of the rows from the first matrix and the columns from the second matrix. So for instance, the first element of the combined matrix is made up of A11 times B11 plus A12 times B21. Let's just talk through another one. Let's say that we're looking at the combined second row and first column. We have A21 times B11 plus A22 times B21. And that gives us our second row first column values of our new combined transformation matrix or what's known as a composite transformation matrix. This method, this pattern, is why we do matrix multiplication the way we do it. A few things to notice in terms of understanding matrix multiplication a little bit better is that when we were transforming our vector, what we did is we transformed it with our B matrix first and then transformed it with our A matrix. And the way in which we write it out, although when I just said it there, it looks like we're reading from right to left, but when we multiply it out and multiply out to find the answer, we get a situation where we're reading from left to right. We're going from left to right for rows to columns. And this kind of, this kind of way of thinking about it is, is similar to composite functions. When you have a function within a function, then you are looking to do the function within that function first and then apply a function of that function afterwards. So the whole right to left thing makes kind of sense in terms of understanding matrices as transformations, as almost like functions, you know? With this newfound understanding of matrix multiplication, it's important to know that matrix multiplication cannot happen unless the columns of our first matrix, of our left-hand matrix, match up with the rows of our right-hand matrix. This is because when we're doing the multiplication, although we're staying there on the same row in the first matrix and the left-hand matrix, we're changing columns. And we're staying on the same column on the right-hand matrix, but we're changing rows. And so therefore, if the changing columns and the changing rows don't match, then it's an incomplete multiplication. We won't be able to do it. But an interesting result is that by understanding how we're doing matrix multiplication, we can find out the dimensions of our expected result matrix before we've even started doing any matrix multiplication. Because if, say, I had a 3 by 2 matrix and I wanted to multiply it by a 2 by 4 matrix, then what I'll be left with, because the columns of the left-hand matrix match up with the columns of the right-hand matrix, the matrix multiplication is possible. And so what I'll be left with is a 3 by 4 matrix as a result. So that's about it, guys. I really hope this video has given you some sort of understanding as to why we actually multiply matrices the way we do. 
and I hope that now you can understand, if you didn't before, how to multiply matrices. If you like the video, then I'd be so grateful if you could leave it a thumbs up. And remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to keep up to date with any new videos coming out from A Clever Chimp. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I will see you all in the next video. Bye-bye.